What's going on, church? Welcome back to another amazing gathering that we get to be together and study God's Word. Why don't we start this off by saying our faith statements together. Join with me. I am, here we go, deeply loved, highly favored, greatly blessed, totally righteous, and destined to reign because of Jesus. Today, this is exciting. We are starting off a brand new collections of talks titled Kingdom Culture. And this is going to be taken out of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. My kind of preaching. Long. Let's go. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, why don't we pray and then we will study uh, Matthew chapter 5. This is going to be a great time together. Jesus, we want to just say thank you so much for a brand new year that we get to gather together. We are so excited about the things that you've got planned for this year. We know that last year was good, but this year is going to be great. And we're just going to lean into you and take all the truth that you desire for us to take this year, apply it to our lives so that we can live transformed. In your name we pray, all God's people said together now, amen. All right. So in your Bible, if you want to go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter five, that'd be great. Or on your phone, you can dial it in through Google. Uh, this is going to be a great time together because we are studying the Sermon on the Mount. How many of you have heard about the Sermon on the Mount, right? Maybe some have, maybe some of you haven't. This is your first time. Well, listen, this is kind of, uh, this is a big deal, right? And here's why. Jesus preached this sermon. And so have a little grace on me today. I'm going to do my best to preach the sermon that Jesus preached, but there's a lot of pressure because I'm not Jesus. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do our best and we're going to work through the Sermon on the Mount. The goal of this was to invite people to participate in heaven's culture rather than earth's culture. The reason why that's so important right now is we know that earth's culture really isn't working out that, that well. I heard some things that were a little interesting the other day. So uh, ever since 2020, the mental health hotline is up 900%. Also, uh, one in four of people that were in between the ages of 18-year-olds and under, one in four during 2020 considered suicide. Uh, for the rest of us that are over 18 years old, that would be one in 10. So we can see that like Earth's culture really isn't satisfying and Jesus knew that a long time ago, and that's why he taught this in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And I'm so excited that he did, because now we have something that we can use for this year to be the foundation of how we do life. All right. So the big idea is this. Let's be kingdom citizens rather than earthly citizens. Yes, we live here on earth right now, but our mindset should be set on the kingdom of heaven because that's really where we are citizens. That's where our hope is. Someday we are going to experience the glory of God forever and ever, and we will spend more time there than we have on this short little amount of time that we have here on earth. So in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, it reads like this. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Or in other words, the poor in spirit means blessed are the powerless. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was unrolling some values right now that he wants us to grip onto. And so value number one is this. We admit that we are powerless and we need God. We admit that we are powerless and we need God. These are, these are some of the ways that we should think about life. We should be people that do not exalt ourselves, but rather boast about who God is. We should be people who do all of our work for God and we don't receive the honor of mankind. Everything that we do should be born out of a heart and a passion to bring glory to God. We should be people who long for the influence of God. Why is that so important? Here's why. Because there are so many things that are trying to influence our thinking on a daily basis. Right away in the morning, we've got Fox News. 
We've got CNN news. We've got Instagram. We've got Facebook. We've got Snapchat. We've got TikTok. And it goes on and on and on on about all of these different outside things that are trying to influence the way that we think. And listen, if we're kingdom citizens, we need to allow God to influence us. We need to allow his truth to influence us. That's where we gain stability. That's where we gain hope. That's where we gain joy. That's where we gain peace. If we just keep that kingdom citizen mindset, a kingdom culture versus an earthly culture. There's a friend of mine, uh, he, we always say to each other back and forth, know your lane, know your lane. You know, know your lane in your relationships. Know your lane in your friendships. Know your lane when it comes to talking with your children. Know your lane when you're out in the workforce. Know your lane, why? Because if you swerve into the wrong lane, you can cause an accident. People can get hurt. And so when it comes to us knowing our lane, we need to recognize like with value number one, we admit that we are powerless and we need God. That's our lane. We need God. Know your lane. In Romans chapter five, uh, six, and then eight through 11, it says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and he died for us sinners. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendships with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now... We can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. You mean we can be friends with the creator of the universe? Yeah. You mean we can be friends with the God that can take our lives at any moment? Yeah. You mean we can be friends with God? Yeah. It's just amazing the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. And we just need to know our lane. We are powerless. We need God. Matthew 5, 4 goes on and it says, blessed are those who mourn. And that word mourn means sad or cry or pain or weeping for they will be comforted. Value number two that Jesus was rolling out was this. We admit that we feel pain, so we run to God for our comfort and our healing. It's totally okay to be transparent with God on how we're feeling. But in earthly culture, <laughs> what, is, what is it that we do? We hear this all the time. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How's your day going? I'm doing fine. You go into the gas station, you're on your way to the refrigerator to grab your morning caffeine drink or whatever, and you turn around, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. But the truth is, is people aren't doing fine. You know what fine means? It means this, freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> F, freaked out. I, insecure, in, neurotic, E, emotional. I'm doing fine. <laughs> it's almost like a quick draw answer. You know, if like you were in the wild, wild west, it'd be like, <whistles> fine. You know, but the truth is, is that we're not doing fine. The truth is, is we need to admit our pain to God so that we can receive the comfort and the healing that he has for us. But if we're camouflaging it under fine, no healing is going to happen. We need to be transparent with God. We can be honest with God. When we mourn over the sin that we commit and recognize that it breaks the heart of God, we can just be honest and say, God, I messed up. I heard a story this last Sunday. A, a lady, her name is Shanae, and she's absolutely incredible. And she was telling her story this last week on how she had made a mistake. And she's like, you can even ask my husband. It was a big mistake. I messed up. And she goes, then I found myself in this chair just weeping 
And she said, I, I just don't, I don't even understand why I was weeping, except for the fact that I recognized that because I messed up, not only did it impact me, affect my family, but it also broke the heart of God. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who recognize that, listen, there are things that break the heart of God. And the reason why they break the heart of God is because God knows what's good for you. And he doesn't want you to go in those directions. And, and it breaks the heart of God when that happens. And she was like, I recognize that I, I broke the heart of God. And she was mourning. But the Bible says, Jesus says a kingdom mindset is this. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who recognize the things that break the heart of God. When we feel grief hit like a 50-foot wave and we feel like we are drowning, we can be honest with Jesus and tell him, I am not doing well right now. There have been so many moments within the last couple of years, ever since our daughter took her last breath on this side of the planet, that we've actually experienced these 50-foot wave, 200-foot wave, 300-feet waves of grief, and it just feels like you're not going to be able to catch your breath. And those are the moments that we turn to Jesus and, and we don't camouflage it with, I'm doing fine. It's the moments that we turn to Jesus and we say, I need you. <laughs> I just need more of you. We're admitting that we're feeling pain, this value that God, God was rolling out to us and we need you for our comfort and our healing. When tears are dripping down our faces for no reason, we can be honest with Jesus. When we come into a worship setting and, and emotions overtake us for one reason or another, and sometimes we have no idea why, we can just be honest with Jesus and we can say, you know what? I admit, I just need your comfort. I just need you. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, it says this, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. The Bible says that in this world, there will be trouble. Jesus knew that, but he left us with a hope. When you experience those troubles, there is a God who comforts you in those troubles. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. We just need to admit that we feel pain, so we run to God for our comfort and healing. That's value number two. Matthew 5, 5, it goes on and says this, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, the word meek or meekness, we don't talk a whole lot about in our culture today. And that is so sad. In fact, when, when you look at the least admired character trait in America today, it's probably meekness. Because people, when they think about meekness, they tie it right to weakness. Pride has actually been the, the read redefined in America as a virtue. It's, it's just like, you know, the strong, the beautiful, the powerful, the intelligent are all the highlighted and being the ones that are the most influential. And, and it's just like we live in this prideful nation and meekness is opposite of pride. And that's what Jesus was focusing on here. He was saying, blessed are the meek. And meekness is not weakness but it's actually power under control. And when you start thinking about that just a little bit, this world could use a little bit more meekness. Power under control. Jesus showed ultimate meekness on the most horrific day of his life. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 23, it says, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. <laughs> There's a concept. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. At any moment that Jesus wanted to call legions and legions upon legions of heaven's angels, at any moment he could have done that. When they were whipping his back, 
when they were pressing a crown of thorns on his head, when they drove nails into his hands and his feet, he could have called heaven's armies, but he didn't. That's power under control. That's meekness. And we get upset about a Facebook comment or an Instagram comment? For real? Look at the pride that we have in our nation. And Jesus is saying, no, blessed are the meek. Value number three, we admit that our pride hurts us, so we humble ourselves before Jesus. James chapter 4, 6 through 10, it says, And he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Or your loyalty is divided between a kingdom culture and an earthly culture. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And listen to this. It says, and he will lift you up in honor. This year, I think the way that some of us are going to have a great year is by simply reducing our pride and increasing our humility. Going to God and just simply saying to him, I humble myself before you. I want to make an impact with this life that you've given me. I don't want to live in the pride of life. I want to live in the humility of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5, 6, it says this. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So value number four, four that Jesus is rolling out here is that we admit that we need spiritual food and we run to Christ to fill us. Hungry, thirsty people work really hard. They're urgent to go get some food. To hunger and thirst for righteousness means this. It means that we should urgently pursue righteousness. Right now, we're about 17 minutes into this talk, and I know that some of your stomachs are probably growling, and you're thinking about what you want to eat, right? <laughs> your stomach's a powerful thing, right? And you're like, ooh, where can we go? I'm, I'm getting so hungry. I want to make sure that I go and get the best food I can. I'm going to run down, get me some Chick-fil-A. I'm going to get me some Popeyes. I'm going to get me whatever you want, <laughs> Chinese food, whatever it is, right? You start thinking about food. You get hungry, and then if you're not careful, that hungry can turn into angry, and then you get hangry. And listen, when mama's hangry, you better get out the car. Are, right? <laughs> but the question is, is like, do we hunger and thirst for righteousness that way? God, we're so hungry for you. We sense this urgency to be in your presence just so that you can fill us and satisfy our hunger pain. Do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? In Jesus' day, water and food was scarce. And so when he was teaching this, he was talking uh, in a way that they understood that a mom and a dad would do anything to make sure that their children are provided for and their hunger pains are taken care of? Would we do anything just to have our hunger for righteousness be filled? Would we do anything? Is there an urgency there? Would we break our daily routines to spend more time with God? Do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? How do we see a church thirst for righteousness? How do we see a neighborhood hunger and thirst for righteousness? How do we see a city hunger and thirst for righteousness? How do we see a country hunger and thirst for righteousness? My dad always used to tell me this, son, when you're raising your family, remember that more is caught than taught. And so if we want to see our cities, our neighborhood, our country, and our world hunger and thirst for righteousness, it starts inside the home. And children matter 
to God. And so as we begin to develop our families under this value of hungering and thirsting for righteousness, they will take that because more is caught than taught. And they will expand that into the neighborhood. It'll go into the city. It'll impact our state. It'll impact our nation. And ultimately, it'll impact our world if we simply hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm going to close this up with Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Listen, I hope that you really enjoyed this. I'm so excited about this year. I'm excited about what God is doing in your life. Matthew 6, 33 says this, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. It starts first with seeking the kingdom and his righteousness. Start this year off right. Search, search, search first the kingdom culture. I love you. God loves you. I'm excited about what he's doing in your life. Let's go ahead and close this up with Psalms chapter 67 verses 1 and 2. Let's say it together. God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth, his saving power among all nations. God bless you. We'll see you next time.